For 75 years, Argonne National Laboratory has accelerated the science and technology that drive U.S. security and prosperity. To celebrate, we're capturing the stories of the people who made it happen. This is Argonne Voices. Physicists Lindsay Bleem and Clarence Chang have gone where very few have ever gone before, the South Pole. Why? Because it's the home of the massive and powerful South Pole Telescope, which uses detectors developed and manufactured at Argonne. With this telescope, Lindsay and Clarence study the origin of our universe by observing something called the cosmic microwave background. Keep listening to learn more about their research, hear surprising facts about the South Pole, and find out what it's like traveling to Antarctica. Here are Lindsay Bleem and Clarence Chang. So Clarence, what attracted you to actually working on in this field? I think things started to take shape in college, where I would have various conversations with my friends about science and how I thought it was both a way for us to gather knowledge about the world around us, but also an expression of our creativity, of our desire to inquire and to understand. And I think that started shaping my own sense as to how valuable science was. I decided to give it a shot and wound up here, which I think is not too bad. And how about you, Lindsay? You and I actually go quite a ways back. We do, <laughs> so. we do. Clarence and I have known each other for about 15, 16 years now. Uh, Clarence was a postdoc when I was a newbie grad student at University of Chicago doing my PhD. That's right. And you chose to do this given all the options in graduate school. So why don't you tell me a little bit about what were your drivers? I guess I've always known that I wanted to do something potentially in the hard sciences. Um, when I was a kid, I liked, you know, when things broke, I would rip them apart and try to put them back together, make things work again. So really hands-on. Um, I considered engineering, did an aeronautical engineering course in high school, a summer camp. Realized I really wanted to know why things worked, um, not just how to design things. So that naturally led me into physics, um, which really gives us the tools to answer the questions about how and why our world works. And I ended up in cosmology um, through just sort of a roundabout path. I did several of the National Science Foundation undergraduate summer uh, research experience programs, and I just loved it. I loved all aspects of it, from being able to dig into these really rich data sets, learn to code, and what came out of my fingers could actually be used to solve these really complex problems. When I got to Chicago and heard my then PhD advisor talk about the South Pole Telescope, this new telescope they were building in Antarctica that was going to give us this awesome opportunity to answer all these questions, I just had to do it. So I was very fortunate to be able to join the project. What were your first impressions when you went to Antarctica? Oh, wow. <laughs> the whole trip, I was just sort of bouncing, right? Because I was going to this amazing place that very few people have been. More people have climbed Mount Everest than have been to the South Pole. And I was getting to see this telescope. I was working on in action, which was just incredible. It still is incredibly exciting. So Antarctica itself, it's extremely dry. It's the world's largest desert. And this makes it a fantastic place for the astronomy we do at the South Pole Telescope. So our telescope observes the phenomena called the cosmic microwave background, which is the glowing relic of the Big Bang explosion at the beginning of the universe. So one of the outstanding questions we have in our understanding of the universe, how it changes over time, is a question about how things looked in the earliest moments, the beginning. And our data really does seem to point at some new physics. That is, the early universe seems to be ordered in some way. And the ideas that we have about its origin, of those, one hypothesis seems to continue to gather support. And it's this idea of inflation. And inflation is kind of weird because it posits that at the beginning, at the very, very early instances, the universe, not only did it expand, but it expanded in an accelerated way. So we call this an early period of cosmic acceleration. I mean, it turns out just by positing that and working that out consistently, you capture most of the features with quite a bit of precision about what the early universe should look like. And our interest in the microwave background or what's called the microwave background is because that is actually an image of the early universe. So the cosmic microwave background is this signal that was 
produced when the universe was about 380,000 years old. It corresponds to a period where the universe transforms from kind of this hot ionized state. So that's a plasma where the protons and electrons are kind of flying around. And the universe eventually cools down and transitions to one where those protons and electrons form atoms. And that transition results in a signal which we can measure. And today that signal appears at the longer wavelengths. And so by studying and looking at the universe in those wavelengths, it turns out we actually can look at the early universe, essentially capture a baby picture. And something we are trying to understand even better is really whether this notion that there was this early period of cosmic acceleration, whether that really happened. And it turns out that particular theory has some concrete predictions about the patterns that we should see when we look out at the early universe. It just turns out these predictions are extremely, extremely challenging to measure. Um, the signal's very, very faint, which requires them building um, incredibly sensitive instruments and putting them at um, incredible sites. The South Pole Telescope is one such instrument. It's at the South Pole because that's an exceptional site. And the detector technology that we put in the telescope is special because of its sensitivity at these wavelengths. And that's something that we developed at Argonne. And being in Antarctica, why do we go to all this trouble? It's because just like the water in your food in your microwave oven heats up and is agitated by microwaves, water in the atmosphere actually both attenuates the millimeter wavelengths we're interested in and can also the jiggling around of the water molecules can actually add a great source of noise to the data. So we really have to go to these remote dry places to do these observations. And it turns out that the South Pole is the absolute best place on Earth to do this. So the sun goes down in the wintertime, which is when we have our prime observations. We're at altitude, which means as far as we can on Earth, we've tried to remove a bunch of the atmosphere by going someplace high. And then we're at the South Pole because it is dry. And that dryness is great for our, our observations. And that consistent, steady dryness is phenomenal. But, you know, as human beings, we like a little bit of humidity in the air. And that's also something that's a bit challenging, discomforting. And that can also interfere with how things go day to day. It's not the most human friendly. Your skin will crack. Um, wounds don't heal super well at the South Pole. It's not great for computers to be in that dry an environment either. We actually had a humidifier that blew on um, one of our computers to keep it running a little bit happier. But yeah, no, it's really a unique place. The first couple of days, especially was adjusting to the altitude. So the South Pole is actually quite high, unlike the North Pole, which is at sea level. We're at 9,300 feet. And the atmospheric elevation actually can change day to day quite a bit up to maybe even 11,000 feet. And so you're going from sea level, right? You fly from New Zealand, which is very low, to McMurdo on the coast of Antarctica. And then you go straight up, basically. There's no acclimation period. You just go from summer to a couple days in McMurdo on the coast where it's maybe 30 Fahrenheit, all the way to the South Pole where it's minus 40, and you're basically two miles up. And that altitude change can be absolutely exhausting. And you're so excited to be there. So the tendency is to want to run out and do everything and... And you just have to really consciously take it easy and let your body adjust while you're there. Because you do get out of breath quite fast and it's a little bit hard to sleep at the beginning. So, you know, the South Pole is this great site. And I think it's great because it's great for the observations. And it is just, it is manageable <laughs> as a human being to go there. Antarctica is not like being in the lab in Chicago. You walk out the door. And like one of my most striking things when I went out to the Dark Sector Lab or DSL where the South Pole Telescope is located is the door into the building is sort of those commercial refrigerator doors you see <laughs> when you're going out, you know, in, in a frozen part in a restaurant. But that's where we have to pull to go in, right? We're isolating the cold out instead of vice versa. And it completely makes sense, but it's just such a weird, weird place. With all these little slight oddities. There's no running water at the telescope. So we uh, we would have a snowmobile to bring our water out, which is critical because we need coffee. And there's a little outhouse, which is solar heated because that's the best way to heat things up in the summer out there. So Clarence, I know you were involved with what's called the first light when we first turned the telescope on with a new camera at the South Pole. What was your experience like doing that? There's a tremendous amount of work, just details associated with getting things to Antarctica. And then you have the, everything works inside this big, essentially a glorified refrigerator, right? This thing that takes everything below one Kelvin. And then you have your superconducting detectors that are down at the bottom. You kind of have to get this all working together. It's easy to just get kind of overwhelmed. 
And then what happens is once it's all together and everything seems to be working, you then look at the sky. And it's a very strange feeling because you think you've done everything, but yet you're constantly worried that maybe there was something just wasn't working, right? And then when you see that first blip, so at what happens is we point the telescope at some bright object and we kind of raster over that object. And as you watch how our detectors respond, you'll see a blip every single time we see that object. And when you see that, it's just a very unusual feeling because it means everything is working and you kind of can't believe it because so much had to go right. So much had to come together. And it's just this feeling of relief. So this was a nice conversation. I mean, so Lindsay and I started in this thing a long time ago, and I think it's great that we are still working at it, that we've kind of grown and our interests have continued to evolve, but that we are in the same place working together with each other. That shared history, I think, is great. Yeah, absolutely. I hope um, in 15 years from now, we'll be you know, able to have a conversation about how we're just coming back from a successful analysis and upgrades uh, to CMBS-4, which is the next big experiment we're really hoping to deploy in Antarctica over the next decade. So really looking forward to both working on that, the deployments, and then the great science we're going to do with that. Argon Voices is an oral history project recording the stories behind decades of world-changing science at the laboratory. To learn more about Argon's 75th anniversary, visit anl.gov.